Ron tells me this is the first time you've seen your book. It is. Congratulations. Me a copy. They said him a copy. They sent me guys a copy. They know he's an influencer. And so was Ben Smith. Congratulations. both ready? Okay. We'll get started in just about one more minute. All right. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 2023 Winter Lecture offered by the Carl G. Greffenstadt Center for Ethics and Science, Technology, and Law uh, at Duquesne in partnership with the Beatrice Institute. I am John Slattery, the director of the Greffenstadt Center, and I'll be your host this evening. And we're very pleased all of you can join us here today, both in person as well as via our live stream online. Um, and I'm especially honored by our special guests this evening, Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld and Dr. John Dolan. So before we begin, I want to briefly introduce you to the Greffenstadt Center um, and talk a little bit about our events, and then we'll, and then we'll jump right into it. So founded in 2019, uh, the center takes an unflinching look at the ethical implications of technology in the modern world with special focus on the perspective of Catholic and other faith traditions. With this goal, the center offers a variety of programs, courses, and partnerships for students and researchers at Duquesne and throughout the Pittsburgh area. Um, so I'm gonna announce a couple of those things this evening, and I have the privilege of actually announcing one of them that we had not yet fully uh, announced yet, which is a tech and policy hackathon happening next month called Hacking for Humanity. Um, so this is a undergraduate and graduate student hackathon sponsored by six organizations across Duquesne, Pitt, and Carnegie Mellon that focus on ethics and responsibility of technology. And this year we're focusing on online hate. Um, so it'll have two tracks. You'll compete either individually or as a team. Um, you'll either be writing policy or be designing and writing new tech and then presenting it. So there'll be cash prizes, individual team advisors from big tech companies like Google and NVIDIA, um, unique opportunities, guest speakers, and more. And it'll, it's a hybrid event. So it'll start online March 18th, and then we'll have a big in-person competition here um, in the Power Center on Friday, March 24th. So if you're interested, you can pick up a flyer at our table in the back um, or see the website hackingforhumanity.online uh, for more in information and to register. 
Um, you can also talk to me about it after if you have questions. All right, a few other things that we have going on. Um, so next week, I'll be giving a lecture on Wednesday, um, sponsored by Siena College and Duquesne's Theology Department on the intersections of technology, theology, and liberation. So you can also pick up a flyer for that outside uh, to register or see more information on our website. Um, and then in March, we're gonna open up two opportunities. We'll have another round of faculty scholars, um, which is open to any academic area or background at Duquesne, but we're also having our first time ever a student research scholarship, which is open to Duquesne undergrads. That'll be undergrads next academic year. Um, it's, as you can see, it's a $2,000 tuition scholarship. And essentially, you'll be working with staff of the center on your own research project, as well as involved in the center's activities and conversations throughout the course of the academic year. So it should be a lot of fun, and watch for that uh, coming in March. All right. Okay, so then before I go any further, I uh, want to especially thank uh, Dr. James DeMassey and the Beatrice Institute and want to give him just a minute to talk about some of the events the Beatrice Institute is offering around Pittsburgh this spring. Thank you so much, John. Uh, very, very grateful to be here this evening. We're so happy to host, uh, to co-host Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld uh, for her lecture this evening. As uh, Dr. Slattery said, my name is James DeMassey. I'm the Executive Director of Beatrice Institute. We are a research and learning um, community here in Pittsburgh that serves anybody who pursues the good, the true, and the beautiful. So we have programming for undergraduates. We have a paid fellows program for undergraduates at any Pittsburgh University. Um, we have a faculty fellows program that has its, uh, its expression in faculty convivia, so any local faculty who are interested in getting involved and forming inter interdisciplinary, interreligious, um, or traditions uh, friendships, intellectual friendships, I encourage you to check our website out. We also host public events and uh, three research projects. The three research projects, one of which is being human in the age of artificial intelligence, is the ages under which we are co-sponsoring Dr. Hertzfeld this evening. Um, we had the privilege, actually, to have Dr. Hertzfeld on the Beatrice Institute podcast last year. So you can find our podcast, which comes out with a new episode every two weeks, on our website as well. I just wanted to highlight a couple events coming up. Uh, in every, About every month, we have a public event. And next month, we are having an event here at Duquesne. It'll be a lecture on Mozart, the man, the myth, the mystery, in an anticipation of the PSO's um, performance of the Requiem in March. Uh, we also have a salon coming up in April on art and uh, art and realism, naturalism. It's, it's sort of a, a moral look at um, the way biblical stories are depicted. And then this fall, for those of you who are interested in artificial intelligence, we'll be hosting an event on the, uh, the completion of Beethoven's Unfinished Tenth that's still in the works, but it should have something to do with the way AI intersects with art, especially um, the, the completion of symphonic pieces. So if you have any questions, we do have QR codes to scan out on a table in the back, as well as information cards, and I'll be available after the event as well to answer any questions. Thank you, John. All right, thanks so much, James. And uh, so without further ado here, I do wanna welcome both of our speakers for this evening to talk on this excellent book. And a special note, this is actually the book launch of this book. You currently cannot buy this book on Amazon, so we have pre-release versions here in the back, and of course, the author with us tonight. So, very, very exciting. Um, Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld is the Nicholas and Bernice Ruder Professor of Science and Religion at St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict in Snowy, Minnesota. She holds degrees in computer science and mathematics from Penn State, as well as a PhD in theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Dr. Hertzfeld teaches in both the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Theology, reflecting her two primary research interests, the intersection of religion and technology, as well as religion and conflict. She has published numerous books, articles, and book chapters over the last few decades on the prospects for AI, ethical issues in technology, and intersections of faith traditions from Christianity to Islam. Responding to her this evening will be Dr. John Dolan, who received multiple degrees from Princeton and Carnegie Mellon in mechanical engineering, an early researcher and engineer of autonomous vehicle technology. Uh, Dr. Dolan is a principal systems scientist with the Robotics Institute at CMU. 
His research interests and numerous publications include topics like autonomous driving, multi-robot cooperation, human-robot interaction, robot reliability, and sensor-based control. So I am, I am so pleased to have them here to help launch Dr. Hertzfeld's excellent new book. So please join me in welcoming our speakers and welcoming Dr. Hertzfeld to give uh, her address. Thank you, John. And thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, I promised John that I would be brief. What that means then is that I'm going to raise a lot of questions and I'm not going to answer most of them. So, uh, but we're going to try to leave plenty of time for you. So if there are particular things that you think, oh, yeah, I got a question about that. I want to hear more about that. You know, think about that. Uh, keep the questions in mind because we definitely want to have a lot of time for some interaction. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the, the title of the book that I just wrote, which I actually saw for the first time tonight myself. Uh, they haven't sent me a copy yet. They sent them to John, but not to me. Um, what I really want to talk about, the first half of the title is Fortress Press. They said, we want something catchy. Second half of the title is mine. You know, what how does AI relate to relationship? And I think there are two ways you can look at that question. The first question is, can we have a relationship with an AI? What kind of relationship? And then the second, what about AI the way we know it now, where it mostly is working around behind the scenes? What is that doing to our relationships with each other? Um, I want to start just with a story. Some of you have probably heard this story before, but a mother is putting her son to bed and she's getting ready to leave the room and turn out the light. And he says, Mom, I'm, I'm afraid of the dark. You know, don't leave me. And his mom says, Oh, don't worry. You won't be alone. Jesus will be with you. And the little boy says, Well, yeah, but I want someone with skin. And, you know, keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that at, at the end of the talk. Is there a difference having a relationship with someone with skin and someone without skin? So, um, AI and relationship, well, it's all over in science fiction, right? Uh, some of it with skin, some of it without. So you've got, um, you know, Joachim Phoenix and her. No skin in that game, um, but definitely some kind of relationship. Go back to earlier movies, you've got uh, R2-D2, C-3PO. Um, yeah, sort of anthropomorphic. They walk around and everything, but they're very clearly robots. You get up to ex machina, we're getting closer to skin, right? Um, so the question is, if we think about all of these movies, they're all about relationship. That's what they're about. That's what the topic is. That's what makes the plot go in these movies. So it really is a question, can we have a relationship with an AI? Or is it just anthropomorphization? Is it just you know a stage beyond the little boy and his teddy bear, let's say. Um, what makes a relationship real? Well, the Swiss theologian Karl Barth said, there are four things that make a relationship fully authentic. And these were his four criteria. He said, you look the other in the eye, you speak to and hear the other, you aid the other, and you do it gladly. I want to look at these four criteria as they relate to having a relationship with an AI. So let's start with number one. Look the other in the eye. Okay. Um, with a lot of AIs, most AIs that are part of our world right now, we can't look them in the eye. You can play around with chat GPT, but you know, it's a bunch of code that's sort of behind the surface. 
Um, on the other hand, with robotics, you could say, well, yeah, we can look a robot in the eye. Why not? Um, there we have Ishiguro, who is one of the foremost roboticists in Japan, who is making extremely lifelike uh, robots, precisely because he says you do need to look the AI in the eye when you can, when it has a physical presence, it has a locality. And so we are used to relating with each other. We're used to relating with someone who's there, you know, who's in front of you, who you can look in the eye. So you could say, well, with robotics, okay, we could check off number one. We could say, yes, we know that for certain types of relational activities with an AI, we do want to look at it in the eye. Okay, so how about speak to and hear the other? Well, I think AI is doing pretty darn good with this one, right? Um, you've got Alexa, you know, go ahead, I'm listening. Um, of course, the problem with Alexa is she's always listening. Um, so <laughs> you don't know what she's listening to. Um, and this is a place where if you don't have number two joined to number one, you start to have issues, right? Because when we join, speak to and hear with look the other in the eye, you know who is hearing what you are saying. But when they are not joined, you don't know who is hearing what you are saying. You don't know what they're going to do with what you are saying. You don't know how long they will remember what you are saying, which is probably forever right now. Um, so there's an issue, okay? Um, now, of course, ChatGPT has been all in the news. Um, so we can say, well, we've been talking about the hear angle with Alexa. Well, how about the speak angle? We're getting pretty good at that, right? I mean, we're getting programs that can, can write fairly decent text. They can speak to us about a topic. And, you know, Google's getting nervous because people are starting to say, I think we're going to use ChatGPT instead of Google to get my information. Because why? Because it feels more relational. Because you're not just getting a list of, well, go look here, go look there, go look there. You're getting what feels like someone speaking to you and telling you what it is you want to know. So, some ethical issues, but you know, AI is doing pretty well with criteria two. So let's try criteria three. Add the other. Okay, now here we would say, whoa, computers are great at adding us. Aren't they? I mean, isn't that what we want? Um, we have things like the Mars rover that can go places that we can't go and be our ears and eyes. We have a Roomba happily vacuuming the floor because I hate vacuuming and don't want to do it, so that's aiding me. Um, we have, um, let's say, a robot that can aid the elderly or babysit for us at times question we get with aid the other is not can computers do it. They do it all the time. The question is, are there some types of aid we don't want them to do? Um, and that's why I picked these two pictures, because I don't think anybody is going to have an issue with uh, the Mars rover. Okay. Pure aid, we can't go there as of yet. Um, this is great. I don't think anybody has an issue with their room but doing the vacuuming. Okay, but when you get into the question of, let's say, child care or elder care, then you have to ask some serious questions. Um, to what extent do we want the computer to do these tasks for us? What might they take away from our doing them ourselves from the relationships that we might have with a child or that a child might have with a variety of human caregivers if we have robotic caregivers. 
what might they take away if we have, especially if we have a more humanoid robot? Now, that particular robot is obviously a robot. But suppose we send in a robot that looks a little more, let's go back, like Ishiguro's robot. Okay, to take care of the elderly, to work in a hospice situation. What might this mean for the elderly person who has to accept their own diminishment, who has to accept the frailty of their own body and the inevitability of their own death? Uh, how humanoid, in other words, should these robotic servants be? So, as I said, I'm going to raise a lot of questions. I'm not going to tell you the answers to these things. Uh, let's ask, though, a little more deeply. Aid the other. Do, is it really the computer that is aiding? Or is it like a team of programmers behind the computer that are giving the aid? In other words, does the computer itself have agency? Um, this is a much deeper question. And uh, nobody agrees on this, so I picked out two people. Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, says, sure, you can say that um, Agency says you're making some kind of internal choice. You have a mental state from which that choice arises. So you could just say the state of the computer CPU is their internal mental state from which their choice arises. Uh, yeah, the aid they give it's coming from the computer. Um, but this raises obviously big questions of responsibility. So if something goes wrong, if the computer trips grandpa and he falls down, you know, uh, is the computer responsible? Was it faulty programming? Um, was it uh, maybe um, some nefarious uh, nephew that wanted grandpa's money and tinkered, hacked the computer to trip grandpa? Um, in other words, how much agency does the computer really have? Uh, the philosopher John Searle says no, the computer doesn't have agency because it doesn't have metacognition. It can't think about its own programming. It can't change its own programming itself. Well, now with deep learning, we might say, well, maybe. Maybe it kind of does. OK. So we're not sure there. So let's take this a step further and say two further questions. How much agency do we want it to have? Um, I just suggested to John that uh, for next year's conference, this would be a really great topic because it leads into a lot of areas um, like autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous weapons. You know, how much agency do we really want? Um, I find that a lot of my students, when they look at uh, these Boston Dynamic dogs, you know, that can open doors and help each other out and stuff, they, they start getting creeped out. Like, ooh, uh, do I really want it, you know, to be that free? Especially if it's carrying uh, a payload of uh, weapons. So that's an issue. Okay. Can computers be moral agents? Okay, two more philosophers, Susan and Michael Anderson, have said to really be a moral agent, you need four things. You need to not be under someone else's direct control. Well, okay, we could have that for a computer. Uh, interact with an environment in a deliberate way. Check. Fulfill a social role. Check. Okay. Is cognizant of responsibility inherent in that role? Ooh, ouch. Probably not. Okay, so the robot that's taking care of Grandpa there uh, could do the first three, can't do the fourth. Okay, does that matter? Well, that brings us to Karl Barth's last criterion. Do it gladly. Okay, can a computer do anything in fact here? Can Roxy do it gladly? Uh, do we want her to? Okay, and this raises, I think, the biggest question. Um, can, do we want servants or do we want partners with AI? 
If we want servants, they're tools. They can serve us. They don't do it gladly. Okay, and this goes back to the original idea of a robot. Gladly means not coerced. It means freely chosen. Uh, the word robot, robota, comes from Old Church Slavonic for servitude, forced labor, drudgery, servant, tool. Okay, so long as we want a tool, we're good. But as soon as we say, no, I want a partner, well, you know, then we come back to poor Roxy there and say, do we want her to be able to say, hey, sorry, darling, I got a headache tonight. Um, or, ooh, no, I'm not doing that. Um, or do we want, ooh, love that is safe and made to measure. It does exactly what we want, but then it's not freely chosen. Now, gladly means one more thing. It means emotion. To do something gladly, you have to feel glad about it, okay? But what does it mean to feel an emotion? According to the psychologist Jerome Kagan, you need four things to feel an emotion. You need perception of stimulus, a change in feeling that is sensory, appraisal of that feeling and stimulus, and then a response. And an emotion takes all four of those. Okay, if you think about it, you know, like think, pretend that you're walking in the woods outside of Pittsburgh and uh, you're on some trail, you hear a rustling in the underbrush, okay? You're gonna have a change in feeling that is sensory. You're gonna get that adrenaline kick, your heart's gonna start beating, you're gonna be ready for fight or flight long before your cerebral cortex kicks in and says, bear, mountain lion? You know, uh, you know uh, person, what, what was that? Um, fear, the appraisal is not just there was a stimulus, it's also appraising what your body is going through. This is gonna be a problem for AI, okay? Now, there are some people who actually aren't good at having that change in feeling that is sensory, particularly for some of the like warmer emotions like empathy. In other words, they might see something happening, okay, but they don't get any feeling about it. You know, I'm old enough to remember Bill Clinton who used to say, I feel your pain, and people laughed at him about that. Um, they don't feel your pain. But they think, oh, well, what would be the socially acceptable thing to do in this situation? What do we call those people? Yeah, sociopaths, you know, if they're not quite as far down the spectrum, but yeah, sociopaths. So would having a relationship with an AI ultimately be like having a relationship with a sociopath? Because it can do number one, it can do number three, it can do number four. Can't do number two. Okay, emotion needs a body. And I think, you know, just the fact, you know, that we use these darn things tells me that we recognize that. That we recognize that um, emotion needs, it, it's represented in the body, it's felt in the body, it's an embodied thing. Okay, which in a way means, uh, oh, well, this is just one last thing I was going to say about being embodied. When we try to make our robots as embodied as possible, we try to put skin on them, we often risk falling into the uncanny valley where people say, I feel a little more comfortable with Asimo there in the middle than I do with the almost human-looking robots. This is probably actually an evolutionary thing for us. In other words, we're just designed to feel uncomfortable with things that are human but not quite. Um, it, it's a way of probably for our ancestors to avoid those who are ill 
deformed in some way. Um, and again, it's a felt response in the body. And of course, we also recognize that when we mediate our relationships through the computer, they're not good enough. They're not fully authentic. They're partial. It's not that they're not relationships. They are. But they're partial. They're not completely full relationships. So servant or partner, this is our dilemma. We want both. We can't have both, OK? We want AI to be our tool, to be our servant, but we also want to have relationships with AI. And we're bound to be disappointed. Um, and so just as a kind of a final note, um, if we look at these criteria, each one became increasingly problematic. We said, well, we can do number one with robots. We can look them in the eye. Pretty good at speak, speaking and hearing. Uh, aiding the other, you know, we're not sure the agency is really theirs, and we're not sure we want them to do certain types of aid. Do it gladly? Uh-uh. They're not going to be able to do it gladly. And the reason points back to number one, that when we look them in the eye, we're not really looking at the same thing as when we look a human being in the eye. OK, uh, because I'm also a theologian, now I'll just pull on my the theology cap and say, the interesting thing that I think Christianity brings to the table of religions is the incarnation. Because what Christianity is saying is, even for God to have a fully authentic relationship with human beings. To know what it is, like Bill Clinton, to feel our pain, he had to put skin on. OK? Now, shameless plug, if you want to know anything more about all of this, there's a book. Oh, and uh, I would be happy to sign one for anyone who might want one. And now I want to turn it over to our other speaker. <laughs> Well, thank, thanks very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Hertzfeld for an excellent talk and also a, a very interesting book, which I had the pleasure of reading over the past month because I got an advanced copy, uh, although in PDF form. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just briefly, because I find myself largely in violent agreement with uh, the book, uh, just give a few impressions and a few maybe slightly different angles, uh, possibly introduce one additional argument, uh, which is related to the topic of the book. So first of all, I really appreciate the, and I think it's a very fruitful way of organizing the book, to look through the lens of Bart's uh, approach to relationship, or just relationship uh, in general, because as she points out in the book, uh, the more typical way, uh, sometimes in the history of theology and currently among those who practice artificial intelligence, is to think of man as being primarily an intellect. Uh, and that, that being uh, the thing that most reflects the, the image of God, which the scriptures say we are made in. Uh, but I think relationship is a very fruitful way to look at it, and it attacks, as she eloquently described, uh, some of the things which are most important in terms of our nature. Um, so I have a few points that are related to that and some of the things that were said. Um, one of them is that I think if you look uh, well, if we, if we simplify things and divide the world into those who are materialists, who believe that there is nothing but matter, and those, on, on the other hand, who believe, uh, who are theists or believe in some sort of transcendent character to man's nature, then um, I think it does become somewhat difficult to create deductive arguments, perhaps on either side, in order to persuade the other person. So, for example, Dr. Hertzfeld points out that uh, the Turing test, which many of you may know about, which is basically, uh, although it has some details we don't need to worry about, a way of convincing a human being that uh, you're, the human being is actually talking to or interacting with the human being when in fact it's not a human being at all with whom one is interacting but a computer, is an operational de definition of intelligence or of human essence. And the problem that I just wanted to briefly point out is that if you have an operational definition of 
human being, then you could probably try to ascribe emotion to that and every other aspect of the human person. And to uh, persuade a person out of that is difficult, so there's this fundamental issue of presuppositions. So I'll just put it there, and at the end I'll come, out, uh, come back quickly to an argument which I think maybe helps to, to budge that um, or affect that um, disagreement a little bit. Um, the other thing that I really want to, another thing that I really want to uh, affirm is the importance that you gave in the book to embodiment. I thought that was uh, excellent and uh, important. It's actually related to some of the things that have been found to be quite difficult in artificial intelligence. In the early days, people did things like creating a block world. Uh, and if we fast forward to now, uh, robots can play chess better than humans in the game of Go. In the block world, they could stack red blocks on top of green blocks. These are all sort of deductive, deliberative things that really reflect the human intellect. But what has been found difficult to do is common sense things, like things that little kids can do easily, figuring out um, how balls move across a room just by observing them or interacting socially with people in hallways or uh, reading body language. These are all things that are commonsensical to us, but they're very difficult for computers to do. And they are tied in some way to embodiment. Um, the third thing that uh, was touched on briefly, it was AI and warfare. Um, and I, I wanted to say something about that as somebody both who has a, a background in uh, the Army and then also uh, have, have been working in the area of uh, autonomous driving. So I hadn't really thought about it too much before, but on the one hand, I think we're all probably familiar with the fact that uh, there's a lot of opposition to putting weapons into the hands of robots and giving them the decision to make, uh, well, to fire the weapons in a way that could cause the loss of human life. Uh, but I think there's really a, a fairly close analogy between that and what we're giving autonomous, let's call them AIs, uh, that drive cars. On the one hand, of course, the goal when you're driving the car autonomously is to preserve life, but you could be put in a life or death uh, question sort of situation. I've often been asked by the press about the so-called trolley problem, or uh, they'll put it some, sometimes this way, if you have to make a choice between running into and possibly killing a, an older individual versus a baby in a carriage, what will you do? Uh, and although for various reasons we could get into it if you're interested in, uh, in, it, in the question and answer session, I think that's somewhat far-fetched, at least given the current state of technology. In both cases, warfare and autonomous driving, we are putting into the hands of an artificial intelligence questions of life or death. And so in that sense, I think there's a there's an analogy between them, and I'll just leave it at that. So here's the last thing uh, that I wanted to bring up, which brings us back to this question of looking at at least an important component of human nature as the intellect. There's a, an argument that has been put forward by various people, including uh, the philosopher Alvin Plantinga and uh, C.S. Lewis in, I think, his book Miracles, which states that the materialist, the naturalist I was talking about at the beginning, who only believes in the existence of matter, has difficulty uh, justifying or grounding the ability of the human mind to apprehend truth because, and I'll just state it sort of proverbially here, um, if the mind is simply a mass of atoms, how can we be confident in its conclusion that the mind is simply a mass of atoms? So it appears that there needs to be something that undergirds intelligence. And my reason for bringing it up is to say that um, even if we were to grant that it's going to be possible to create an intellect that is passing the Turing test, apparently exactly like a human intellect, that would, I would say, be ultimately a immediate um, creation of God who created our own intellects, and we then have created it in the form of an AI, and in that sense still has a transcendent component, uh, and, and therefore defeats the materialist assumption. So um, in concluding, I just want to again say I really appreciated the, the work that you did in the book and uh, very much enjoyed reading it. Um, I think, don't remember if you pointed this particular uh, story out, but you may have in the book, but certainly other ones like it. There's the story which many of us know of Pygmalion, uh, and that was the attempt, an ancient story of a sculptor who loved the statue so much that he created that he wanted it to come to life, and in the story it does. This impulse uh, is something that has been with humankind for a long time. 
but I think it's, uh, it's a delusion ultimately, as you eloquently pointed out at the end of your talk. And uh, I heartily agree with the idea that a AIs are tools. They're not uh, something that we should seek to make our partners in the sense of our, our equals the way that we have relationships with other human beings. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hertzfeld, Dr. Dolan. Um, that was really fantastic and interesting. And I just want to open it up to questions from uh, all the guests here today. So let's just uh, can start with that. There is a microphone in the back there. Um, That'll probably be helpful, but we can, if you have a question, raise your hand and we can, we can move it around there. Right up here. Great. Hold on one second. That way we can hear you on the live stream. We don't want them to miss your, miss your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so nowadays they have children's movies about technology and how they enhance friendship. And if anyone likes children's movies, the movie Ron's Gone Wild is adorable, but it also paints... AI in a very interesting picture, because AI in that movie is like responsible for creating person-to-person -person friendships. I'm just wondering if you've seen it, or if you think the way that we're you know, showing kids to live through technology is going to bite us eventually. I haven't seen it, but I'm definitely going to go look for it. Um, yeah. I, I do think that, um, you know, Encouraging our kids to have relationships with computers. Um, I mean, it already bites us in some ways. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, there, there have been toys, like there was a doll that came out about, I don't know, five or six years ago, um, where it, it, you know, it was sort of a simple prototypical AI, but the child could talk to it and it would remember certain things a child had told it and, and things about the child that then it would spout back. Um, and the thing was Bluetooth enabled and they found out that, you know, any device within a certain radius of the house, and it wouldn't have to be all that close, could tap into the Bluetooth of this, you know. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is one of the things that Toya was programmed to say is, you can tell me anything, I won't tell anybody. And, you know, of course, the thing was, uh, you don't know who is listening in on that conversation or on the things that your child might be saying to this toy. Um, so I, I do think um, that if we encourage kids to, to treat their AI-enabled toys as if they were humans, we're going to run into some of those, you know, issues uh, of privacy, um, issues of, uh, and, and then of course there are probably deeper issues too, um, that uh, if the child thinks they can, you know, relate to this toy and then they can turn it off at will, are they going to feel that way about their human friends too? In other words, it, it, we, it's hard enough as a child to sort out what's going on um, that I don't think we want to make it harder for them to confuse categories. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that too, and I had meant to say it when I was talking about the big Malian story, is that uh, that story is in part uh, an illustration of someone wanting to create a companion in his own image. Uh, without any of the, without having to go through any of the difficulties of actually forming real relationships, which is uh, a difficult but uh, clearly fruitful experience for all of us as, as human beings. And this is a, a question that comes now that sex bots are starting to become a thing. I mean, you know, Roxy up there, she's real. You can buy her. Every time I show that to my students, all of a sudden they're whipping out their phones. They're like, "Oh yeah, you know, you get one of these for this much." Um, but, you know, the real question, if it's very much like Pygmalion, he, want, he didn't think human women were beautiful enough. He wanted to create the more beautiful, perfect lover 
And then, of course, fell in love with his statue, wanted it to be his lover. If we have, and we're going to have sex bots, what is that going to do for people having sex with each other? Will they suddenly expect each other to be as malleable, as perfect, um, as uncomplaining? Uh, no. You know, Sherry Turkle says, we're looking for love that's safe and made to measure, but love isn't meant to be safe and made to measure. Love is meant to draw us out, to challenge us, to change us, to make us grow, sometimes in very difficult ways. Um, a sex bot's not going to do that. And please uh, introduce yourself when you ask the question. Thanks. Yes, my name is Lena, and uh, I'm a first-year PhD student here in the Philosophy of Communication and Rhetoric Department. And my emphasis is in rhetoric and technology and uh, ethics. So um, I just have three questions. They're big, so I'm going to try <laughs> to make them <laughs> simplify them. Uh, with our interaction with the current AI, how close do you think we are to the singularity? That's one. Two, um, we all know that technology or AI will never be able to act on its own because they're, they don't have free will and consciousness, but can they mimic free will and consciousness through programming? And the third question is, do you think our relationship with the AI shows that human humanity is on a crisis at this point in the postmodern world we live in today. Thank you. Wow. Well, th these are really simple questions. So I think <laughs> yeah. just, you know, just knock them out. <laughs> really simple <laughs> questions. Um, you know, I, I don't really believe in the singularity. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Can you explain to people what the singularity oh, is that they don't know? Yeah, the singularity is supposed to be that moment when computer intelligence exceeds human intelligence. And because the computer can, at that point, um, learn on its own, change its own programming, the idea is that we'll, in a sense, have an exponential curve where, you know, computers are getting smarter, 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 and then when they kind of cross that boundary of human intelligence, they're going to go like that. Um, and then, of course, the question is, well, then, will they decide they don't need us? You know, what might happen? So that would lead into your third question. People like Nick Bostrom have laid out different scenarios of what, you know, could happen. Um, Ray Kurzweil is another great believer in the singularity. Um, because I don't think computers are going to become sentient or conscious, um, I don't think this is going to happen. Um, on the other hand, and this is a whole different talk that I give, in reference to your third question, I do think that we are possibly approaching a technological inflection point. But it is not just artificial intelligence. You know, in fact, I think climate change is the greater problem that we are facing. Um, back in the 50s, a bunch of physicists were having a lunch at Los Alamos Labs. And the physicist Enrico Fermi, um, they're, they're talking about uh, ET. Is there extraterrestrial intelligence out there? And then and Fermi says, where is everybody? You know, if there's intelligent life on other planets, why haven't we heard from them yet or at least run into their technology yet? And, you know, there, there are different answers. This is called Fermi's Paradox. There are different answers you can give to Fermi's Paradox. The one that worries me is, um, to paraphrase, there's an old Amish saying, I grew up here in Pennsylvania, there's an old Amish saying that says, we grow too soon old and too late smart. Okay, and I wonder if it isn't built into evolution that we grow too soon technologically capable, but too late ethically responsible. And that there might be other planets where life has evolved, but 
assuming that evolution works pretty much along the same lines on other planets that it works on this planet, there are certain things that are built into evolution, a certain amount of competitiveness, a certain amount of, you know, the, the survival of the fittest, um, a certain amount of, you know, uh, nature red in tooth and claw. And if we don't grow out of that, while we do grow technologically capable of destroying ourselves and our planet, then this might very well be why we haven't heard from any other technologically advanced society. Because we hit that bottleneck. And, you know, I, I'd like to hope we're going to get through it. But I have my days when uh, I think we're not. Dr. Dolan? I guess uh, on the singularity, I, I agree with Dr. Hertzfeld. I, I think we, have, we do have plenty of things to worry about, though. There are various pernicious uses of AI, uh, facial recognition and attempts to control the populace in China and uh, things like that, deep fakes, uh, where very convincingly people could be shown to be doing or not doing things that actually didn't happen. Um, so those are, I, I think, the more uh, active concerns more so than worrying about I didn't see the movie, but I guess uh, a version of the singularity would be one of the Asimov robotics movies where suddenly all the robots in the factory are enlivened and they go out and create mayhem or take over the world. I don't see that happening. Hi, my name is Ted Quirkovlis. I'm a physics professor here at Duquesne. And my question is, you know, and all this research on AI, not just you, but you know, the whole community, you know, it seems like it's also, if we flip it around, it's also teaching us something about what it means to be human. And I wonder if you could just speak you know, a little bit about what you've learned about humanity through your, your studies here. Well, I think uh, you guys probably heard that. I think it means being embodied. Um, in other words, we're not just brains, um, you know. Uh, as you pointed out, originally people who were approaching AI thought we, you know, we're just reason. It's just all about reason. Um, and realized very quickly that no, it's not. Um, and uh, moved on then to saying, well, but it's operational. It's about doing things. It's about function. And then quickly realized, yeah, but what functions define being human, okay? And ultimately, I would say it's about relationship. Um, and certainly in the Christian tradition, they would say it's about love, you know, um, love one another. And, uh, but to do that, you have to be embodied. So I kind of put those two things together, that relationship demands embodiment and that really it's all about relationship. Um, that's what being human is, is about. I think keying off that, um, because of this, it, in part because of this progression where um, AI researchers have had to learn to be a bit more humble about what can be done. And of course, to be fair, the deep learning that you had mentioned is an, an amazing uh, leap ahead in some ways in terms of capabilities, but it still doesn't put us anywhere near what the general artificial intelligence by which is meant full human capabilities or even beyond human capabilities. So I was just going to say one thing it teaches us about humans is that we are maybe more fearfully and wonderfully made than we thought because we combine all these different capabilities. It's not even, it's kind of a clinical wor word, but the emotions, the ability to pivot from one task to the other, all the things that we can do, there's no robot remotely capable of that at this point. And although the abilities will increase over time, it's hard to conceive, as we've been talking about tonight, of a robot that would actually be fully capable of all the things that humans can do, even in the Turing sense. Uh, I mean, not the specific test he had, but just to take one simple example. I've had people tell me, or at least put out there, the idea that they want to field a robot team by 2050 that's going to win the World Cup against human teams. I can guarantee you that's not going to happen. And I, 
I don't know, the, the advances that would be necessary to do that would be profound and it would take a very long time. And that's just one of hundreds of thousands of things that humans can do amazingly well. And of course there are counterexamples in terms of the, the Go game and, and the chess and all, but those are very narrow sort of silos of capability. You know, building off of that fearfully and wonderfully made, there are those who have said, look, um, we, we were able to, you know, figure out the genetic structure of, of the human genetic code, so why can't we eventually just figure out the neuronal structure of the brain? But that's not going to be enough because we also have a whole neuronal structure in our enteric system. You know, people talk about having a gut feeling. It's true. We've got a lot of neurons in our gut. But wait, that isn't all either, because now people are finding that we've got this whole microbiota. You know, that, that we're actually, there's more back cells of bacteria in us than actual cells of us. We're a whole ecosystem. And if you wanted to reverse engineer, you'd have to reverse engineer the whole darn thing. Um, that's a lot to reverse engineer. So the brain would not be sufficient because, well, then you've got to deal with the chemicals in the brain. But the chemicals in the brain are influenced by the same chemicals that are generated in our gut. Those are influenced by the microbiota. You got the wrong microbiota, you get clinically depressed. Um, it's all working together. Uh, in We're just way more complex than we ever dreamt. This is what gets us into Battlestar Galactica territory and the Cylons. <laughs> That's where we're yeah. getting into. Uh, James. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is James <coughs> DeMassey. Um, my question, I, I guess, is twofold. The first is, uh, I was wondering if you could define intelligence as you're using it, um, especially if, if we're not going to define it operationally, unless we think we should only be defining intelligence operationally. And then, uh, consequent to, the, to that question, I'm also thinking about chat GPT and just the sort of radically impressive things I've watched it do with language and think about relationship and language and the way um, most relationships uh, are formed linguistically. And I'm wondering if you have a sense or either of you of, of where you would draw ethical lines with chat GPT if it's aggregating you know, human intentions through patterns and then you can sort of draft something and say, yeah, that's better than what I was gonna say or mm. it's just as good and then you put it out as a sort of product of your own intelligence, however we want to define that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you could just maybe comment on those two, those two slightly related questions. One of the problems with artificial intelligence is that we don't have a cut and dried, you know, definition that says, okay, here's intelligence, here it isn't. Um, I tend to think of it, I mean, when people ask me that question, I usually go back to, um, there was a, a senator who was asked uh, to define pornography. And he said, well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. You know, I think with intelligence, most of us would kind of say the same thing. We can't define it. We know it when we see it. Now, ChatGPT has maybe, yeah, a certain, I mean, it has a facility with words, okay? Um, it's, of course, on, I mean, it's working off the backs of all the human beings that have put all the written information out on the internet. So it's, you know, scavenging, looking for probabilities, pastiching things together. The thing it hasn't got is a mental model. It hasn't got a mental model of the world. So it doesn't know when it's bullshitting us. <laughs> and it bullshits us a lot. Now, it's not lying, because to lie you have to actually know you're saying something isn't true. It doesn't live in the realm of truth and falsity, because it hasn't got a mental model. So it's just a great bullshitter. Yeah, I was thinking a similar thing. I mean, another example. So it's difficult to define intelligence, but maybe we could try to get at it a little bit by saying what it's not. And Searle's Chinese Room is a good example of that. And the idea there is, uh, what would you say? Would you say that the following is an intelligent system? 
uh, you're going to translate from English to Chinese or vice versa. And there's a little man in the room who doesn't know anything about either language, but he has a very good dictionary. And uh, he simply takes in the input in Chinese and turns it into English or vice versa. That's not intelligence. I don't think any of us would claim that that's intelligence. And yet, it's not a bad uh, analogy of what at least some computer programs are doing when they um, evince intelligence or seem to be presenting it. So that's one thing that occurred to me. The other thing is that, uh, I mean, I'm not prepared to define this in detail, but we talk about a lot of different kinds of intelligence. And I guess thing, one thing related to what I had said before is there's sort of physical intelligence having to do with being embodied, common sense about the way the world works, and uh, the fact that, for example, this is something that one of my colleagues is doing via learning. If you look at various images on the internet, um, if there's a screen by itself, it's more likely to be a TV. If it's with a keyboard, it's more likely to be a, a computer. So, I mean, that's a fairly easy one to encode and do through learning. But there are many things like this that we, as we're growing up, uh, partly through the way that our minds are initially formed when we're born and partly through experience are able to pick up. It's just another kind of intelligence, which I guess my only point is intelligence is a complex entity which has many aspects to it. Well, and just to add on to that too, sort of from a historical perspective, you know, human intelligence is a very weighted task. You know, if you know the history of measures of human intelligence, you get into the history of eugenics, you get into the history of racism, you get into sort of the, the foundations of sort of Nazi ideologies, which was a lot about what is the perfect intelligence and how do we achieve these things. And a lot of those legacies end up in sort of this technological field as we try to sort of reproduce what is human intelligence and how do we measure it. So as we understand a lot of things I tell my students is as we understand intelligence, we have to sort of separate humans have human intelligence, computers have computer intelligence. To cross over the boundaries gets you into a lot of dangerous areas. And even to measure human intelligence, the best you can do is say, well, I measured them and they're intelligent on this test. But to extrapolate that over, then these humans are intelligent and these are not intelligent in a generalized sense gets you into really dangerous areas. But it just sort of accentuates the importance of conversations like this because I feel like that word gets thrown around all the time in terms of what's intelligent and what's not. So yep. it's good to keep those perspectives on it. Uh, I think we had a question right here. Yeah, so I guess, um, well, first, I'm John. I'm just a software engineer here in Pittsburgh. And I had two questions. One about relationship. You, We talked about, you know, there are certain tasks we're comfortable with AI or robotics doing, such as, um, you know, Roomba is cleaning the house, doing things like that. But you also mentioned those problematic ones potentially where you know caring for the elderly or children. Those are both more extreme examples and opposites. But where do you draw the line? Where is that intersection in which we are sacrificing something? Because certainly from a theological point of view, we would say that service, even if it's menial, can have benefits. Um, even repetitive tasks can teach you something about what it means to be human. And have we already gone too far in a sense in that? And two, you mentioned the uncanny valley of, um, effect and the reason is maybe, in, hypothetically, maybe that's an evolutionary trait. But again, from a theological perspective, could we also maybe suggest that, at least in Christianity, we talk about the image of God mm -hmm. in which that is something that we are embodied with. That's part of being fearfully and wonderfully made. It's part of the reason why we'll never be able to fully get to a human kind of replication no matter how good, whether it's through generated art or an actual physical form with skin, is because we cannot replicate that image onto um, a non-embodied being? Wow. Again, two little <laughs> questions there. Um, the first one, uh, different people are going to draw that line in different places. Um, I think... Uh, one of the things that we need to take into account, though, because often with any kind of service or aid, we look at the person being served, and we say, okay, is this in some way going to diminish harm or otherwise just not completely fulfill the person who's being served. And you kind of see that when you say, well, do you really want the robot taking care of your children? Will that, how will that affect the, the way the child develops and grows up? Um, but Shannon Valor has written a really interesting paper from an Aristotelian perspective where Aristotle says, 
we develop virtue through doing things. And so the question then you have to ask is, what about the server? In other words, if we have robots, let's say, taking care of the elderly, what are we missing out on by not taking care of the elderly ourselves? Um, and, uh, you know, in what way might uh, this affect not just the elderly person, but their family, who might decide they don't need to visit so often, but they're not going to hear all of grandpa's stories anymore, or they're not gonna have the chance to develop the virtues of patience, for example, which sometimes serving the elderly takes a lot of patience. So, um, yeah, I think you're right that even a repetitive task, even a task that takes a lot of patience, um, we may be called to those tasks to grow in various virtues ourselves. Uh, as far as the image of God, you know, theologians down through the ages have been debating what that is. Because in Genesis where it says human beings are created in the image of God, it doesn't spell out what that image is at all. Um, so some have said, if you go back to some of the early church fathers like Augustine, they said it's intellect, it's reason. They were very Aristotelian. Um, but you go a little further, uh, biblical scholars said, no, it's function. We're God's hands on earth. You know, it's doing God's will, serving God's purpose. Systematic theologians in the last century said, no, it's relationship, at least from a Christian perspective, if you believe in a triune God, God is a relationship. You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a relationship built into God's very being. Therefore, we image God in our relationships so that there's no image of God that's just in me. The image comes when I relate to another person. The image is in the relationship itself. So anyway, that's just a, a very quick look at some of the ways theologians have looked at the image of God um, that does then make you ask, well, so then computer. Well, we've already seen that we can't just isolate reason and give it to a computer much as we would like to. Functions, yeah, we can give the computer certain functions and it's very good at it. But we've then you run up against, you can't just say it's function because what about, uh, well, we'll go back to poor grandpa who, you know, um, may have Alzheimer's, who may be bed bound. He's not real functional anymore, but I like to think he still has capacity for the image of God being still a part of him and of his life. Uh, so then you go to relationship. Mm -hmm. Time for just one or two more questions here. Do we have other ones over here? I think we had just a couple right here. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Joey. I'm here with the Beatrice Institute. I found it very interesting that you mentioned that there's opposition to integrating AI and robotics into warfare. And it made me think that within human violence and human warfare, there's the option of mercy to spare a life. Mm -hmm. So I guess my two-part question is, is, um, are, is AI capable of mercy? And is it, will it ever be possible to integrate mercy into AI and robotics? There's a roboticist at Georgia Tech called Ron Arkin who actually makes the argument that he thinks um, autonomous robots uh, would be better, it would be more ethical than soldiers because he would say that a lot of soldiers commit war crimes. A lot of soldiers, you know, their buddy was killed and they want revenge. You know, an AI wouldn't have those emotions that it, it wouldn't act out of, out of revenge or, or out. On the other hand, if we look at the history of, of weapons developments, one of the things you see is this continual distancing of the person from their enemy. You know, you start with hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Well, then you put people on horses that they're just a little further away. They can have a long lance and the person is over there, but you're still seeing them. You're still looking them in the eye. Um, with guns, they found that going back to um, an analysis of um, soldiers in World War One, the majority of them didn't fire because they looked their enemy in the eye. But in World War I, you also have the development of the airplane, aerial combat, and the dropping of bombs. Well, once you can drop a bomb on a city, you're not looking your target in the eye anymore. And so we've taken the soldier off of the physical field of battle. Now, if we give our weapons to autonomous robots where they are not only delivering the payload, but they're making the decision when and how to do that. You've also then taken the soldier mentally away from the battlefield. Right now, drone operators suffer as much PSTD as actual soldiers on the battlefield because in a way they're still mentally there. But if we take that away and having computers make the decision it's one more step of distancing. And every step you take that distances you further from the person you're going to kill makes it easier to kill. I have a, a quick follow-up comment. That was an excellent answer. Uh, but I'd say if you think that mercy can be put into an algorithm, then you could probably put it into a robot or an AI. But I think you can't. I think that mercy is a complex moral sentiment uh, I've just been reading one of the zillions of biographies of Lincoln and his um, leniency towards the South and wanting to include them again. But that was a complex moral calculus that he was going through, trying to balance all kinds of things. And using the word calculus maybe is uh, mischaracterizing it from, from what I said before, right? It was, a, uh, it was a judgment. And it's very difficult to put something like that into a computer program, uh, even though there's certainly a large group within our society that would think that every judgment like that ca is computable. Uh, and that's one of the things that I was getting at with my remarks that we have, I think in the Christian tradition, we have a sense of transcendence and ineffability almost, or non-computability anyway, of certain aspects of human nature. But we're fighting against a secularist mindset that would contradict that. All right, I think we have three people waiting for questions. We'll do those last three. One, two, and three, right here. Hi, my name is Mackenzie. I'm also with Beatrice Institute. Um, my question's in a slightly different direction. I guess I was wondering if you had any opinions scientifically or theologically about the increasing use of implanted technology or like chips or anything along those lines. I don't think, um Theologically, there's actually an issue with that in the sense that we already use cochlear implants and, and heart pacemakers and things like that. Um, but the interesting thing is that when I ask my students, you know, if you could just have a chip implanted in your brain um, and, you know, you would have instant access to Google, Wikipedia, ChatGPT, whatever, would you do it? Usually there's like maybe two guys who go, yeah, bring it on, you know, <laughs> and everybody else is like, no way, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's interesting to think why do people feel that way. I mean, of course, you can say, well, then I could be hacked, you know. Uh, people say, well, then I, I, it, I would be so easily tracked. And I say to them, you're easily tracked already. You're carrying your tracker in your pocket, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, how big a step is there from carrying that thing in our pocket all the time? And if any of you are at all like me, you, you know, you forget it and leave it at home, you turn around and go get it. You feel naked without the darn thing. Um, is it that different than maybe sticking a chip in your wrist? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, the only, uh, that's what I, I was thinking along similar lines, the only thing I would add is um, if you think about, well, I think one of the 
things that we would want to avoid uh, in, well, let's see, what do I want to say? We benefit from educating ourselves. If we had the entire internet at our command and, and in that sense had all knowledge uh, that hum humanity has been able to create instantly at our command, uh, we wouldn't be able to go through that growth process of education in the same sense, I don't think. And that, that would be a real weakness, just to point out one thing. When my students say to me, well, I don't need to memorize anything because I can Google it any time, I always say, boy, you are just going to be the dullest person at a party. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Grant Cradle. I'm an undergraduate student here. And uh, when it pertains to the geopolitical atmosphere of the world, do you believe that there is a race to achieve the most efficient and applicable artificial intelligence? And how do you think that would differ ethically between nations if you do? And do you think there is an importance for America to lead in this technology? Yes. Um, <laughs> that answers the first question. Uh, second question, yes. Um, there is a difference. Uh, I teach computer ethics at my university. I see a real difference um, between how my Chinese students approach ethical questions and, and how my American students approach ethical questions because they are grounded in completely different theological and ethical um, moral systems. Um, what was the third question? Oh, is it important for us to lead? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, I, I guess one way to answer it would be by asking who will lead if we don't. And I think the clear answer right now is China. And China has definitely deployed the technology in some questionable ways. I, I think we have as well, uh, but not so much from a government policy standpoint as in some cases undesired byproducts of not having appropriate um, populations in the learning uh, databases and things like that. Uh, and for all of uh, our imperfections as individuals and as a nation, I would rather have America be uh, leading in the technology than China. On the other hand, I would rather have Europe lead. Um, <laughs> I, I, besides teaching at an American university, um, I also work for a Slovenian research uh, association. Uh, research Institute, and uh, there's a lot more going on in Europe right now when it comes to AI and ethics. A lot of European universities are beginning programs in this field. Um, I'm on several doctoral committees of, of people who are getting doctorates in AI and ethics, and they're all over on the other side of the pond. I think the Europeans are much more concerned about uh, the ethics of this. And I think some of that has to do with their history, the history of warfare in the 20th century mm -hmm. in Europe, well, and, and the 21st century, yeah. you know, ongoing right now. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would rather we led than China, I would rather Europe led than us, <laughs> but I don't think they will. Thank you for these um, questions, answers. I think these are essential uh, to be discussing rather than being so awestruck by artificial intelligence and what it can do. Um, oh, my name is Özim Sayrak, Department of Communication and Historical Studies. Um, so we had been focusing in this uh, discussion on information processing and I heard you say the non-computational aspect of being human, which relates to what we do in my department, which is the question of meaning, right? So rather than information, in terms of relation and connection, what is meaning as part of human life in our world? Um, so going back to the example of caring for a child or, a, or an elderly person, what do you see when you look at the eyes of that person? Right? Because it's not just looking. We see something that is infinite, right? We see fragility. Uh, we're inspired by that and maybe it expands the range of our caring because we expire as human beings. We are limited, uh, we are mortal. So all those things robots can't see when they look. 
And I just wanted to bring that to attention. There is so much more to being human than just processing information. And we get to forget that when we talk about artificial intelligence. Thank you. I think those are just the perfect comments to end this. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. And thank, help me thank our speakers here. Books are for sale in the back. They are cheaper than you can find them on Amazon in a few weeks, so please do get one. And Dr. Hertzfeld will hang around to answer questions some more and uh, sign some books as well. And there are refreshments right outside. Thank you all so much.